Will you pray with me, please? We are blessed, O oh God, with so many wonderful people and such a great time to be together. We know that in our midst are folks who struggle, and in our midst are folks who are celebrating. And so we pray that as all of us come before you, that we are able to give you praise, that we are able to open our hearts to one another, and that we are able to move forward in our lives in faithful ways. Anoint us in this service today as you continue to bless us every day. But anoint us such that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts are acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. 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 In a very full worship service and a complex world, and actually with a scripture reading that is jam-packed with things that can cause conflict as well as bring comfort, my message today is pretty simple, maybe even too simple. I have two points to make in the time that we have, and they are a bit far apart. <coughs> Please forgive me for what some might call the inelegance of my commentary today. There are often times when speakers and preachers are just not as elegant as we should be. One of my points is about marriage, and the other is about children. I said my points are far apart, but some would say that marriage and children are closely related. In fact, there are some who say, you cannot have one without the other. I disagree. Now, as some of you will know, you don't have to agree with me to be a part of this congregation. Um, but we can disagree together, and we can agree. But in this case, I disagree. There are some who would say that the gospel passage that Woody read today requires one to go along with the other. Again, I disagree. So let's proceed in these inelegant ways and see why today in this message, marriage and children are not as related as we may think. The first thing we need to do is talk about the first part of today's text. As the Gospel of Mark presents the story, religious leaders who are happy with the status quo ask Jesus a gotcha question. Do you remember gotcha questions? They pop up, you know, about every four years, about now. It's funny that this scripture pops up every three years, about now. But the religious leaders came to ask a gotcha question to this guy, Jesus. As we tell the stories of Jesus that many of us love to hear, we get the picture that the Pharisees are not so trusting of Jesus. In this gospel story, they are trying to strip Jesus, but actually they're trying to trip Jesus, maybe strip him of his credibility. They're trying to trip him up by getting him to say something that goes against the Bible teachings of their day. Well, in this case, Jesus answers by quoting scripture back to them. And then after that, he has to do some further education with the disciples. Sort of like, you know, after the debate, he had some explaining to do. <clears throat> I hope you can receive these words in the ways they were meant. I hope we will always remember that in the Gospel of Mark, many scholars think this is the most social justice oriented gospel. In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus was redefining traditional thinking. And while dealing with a local issue, he was also changing a global perspective. Jesus was describing a completely different way of experiencing God's realm, the kingdom, as what he read from the inclusive version, um, the kingdom that we grew up with. I shy away, as many folks know, from using the word kingdom because this is about relationships. It's not about land, it's not about real estate. It's a realm. 
It's not a land grant. So Jesus is describing this in a completely different way and of how we can experience this. But you know, if you read the papers, if you watch television advertising, if you look on the internet, if you live in Minnesota or Washington or where else right now? There's some stuff going on in Iowa and various kinds of Maine, places. Maryland. Mar Maryland and Maine, exactly. You will see that anti-marriage equality people use anti-marriage equality people use this passage of Mark all the time to promote a so-called biblical model for marriage. We saw that in California in Prop 8, and as we've just talked, we see that around the country in various states right now. The thing is, this passage is not about a definition of marriage. As you can see from Jesus' follow-up with his crew, it is about divorce. Quite frankly, if we are going to have a discussion about marriage based upon the sayings of Jesus, clear-headed, thinking people would have to conclude that Jesus spoke, spoke way more about breaking up than about getting hitched. This passage is not pro-marriage. It is anti-divorce. And from the reading I do, I have concluded that Jesus' message was anti-divorce in his time because he was pro-women. This could be a long discussion someday, but today is not the day. Don't read any more into what I am saying than is really there, but do read into this message that Jesus proclaims equality and seeks legal protection for women in a time when women were considered property to transfer from one man to another in marriage. What I hope we can remember about this passage on World Communion Sunday is not that it speaks more about divorce than marriage. What I hope we really get to is the concluding point. What I hope we remember is that the whole passage shows a wonderful way of faithfully connecting with God's realm here and around the world. We can assume that the Pharisees come to trick Jesus with a gotcha question knowing that his rabbinical credibility was on the line. And in his response, Jesus not only affirms his non-conventional, non brilliant insight, he rebuts the Pharisees and their proof text baiting ways. As you read the ending of this passage and recognize it as the subject of so many syrupy paintings and stained glass windows, you have to see the light shining through. Jesus says that the keys to receiving the realm of God are not in the hands of the proof texting religious bigwigs. The keys are in the lives of little children. Now think about that. And remember that this is not about childish thinking. <clears throat> this is about childlike living. Now children are not without problems. Or so I am told. Does anyone want to share? <laughs> but I tend to think that a little child is without fears and prejudice until they learn it at a very young age. Did you notice the little adjective? It's the kind of thing in Bible Bites I try to teach us to look for those little hints. Those little, thing, those little things that really give the message. The little adjective in this statement. Way before Dr. Phil, even Jesus of Mark's Gospel knew that children learn from adults' behaviors. We are taught fears and prejudice at some point. And often the best we can do as we grow up is to grow our self-knowledge. And hopefully, that will teach us to recognize our prejudices and fears so that we can adapt our behaviors to not let prejudices and fears get the best of us. 
Since the word we have is that the realm of God is evidenced and experienced among little children, how is that inspiring and instructive to us? Perhaps it would be good for us to do some inner work and get connected with that. Remember, again, this is not about being childish. I think the point is to be that the point is about childlike receptiveness. The point is like childlike openness, childlike energy, childlike wonder, childlike trust. Now, if you've noticed this painting over here, and maybe Russ can turn for our internet audience and just get a shot of this, that this painting is something that we've had in the Bloom community for uh, a while now, for almost a year. It is something that I hope to be framed and hanging in Bloom's office, and Bloom's location, whatever that may be, someday. It's a print of a painting done by Devona McLaughlin Cox. You remember Reverend Dwayne Cox? It's Devona, it was his, is his late wife. Well, I'm not much of an aw shucks kind of guy, although I do cry pretty easily. This painting really speaks to me, and it reminds me of the words we heard today. And maybe the traditional language is what you remember most clearly. Truly, I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms and laid his hands on them and blessed them. As we seek God's realm in the midst of a very adult world, Jesus told us to experience it as children. I wonder if you can look into this painting and imagine seeing yourself in the picture. In doing so, you could be taking a step in a very good direction. There is much more that we can discuss in a passage like this. As I said, it's, it's just jammed. And it can be controversial and comforting. But there is an overall point in this whole thing. When the bigwigs came with a very adult question. Jesus turned the thinking to have childlike wisdom. For today, this inelegant effort will have to suffice. Amen. Amen. Be worth your salt. Be at peace with others. Honestly, this sounds like the same thing Dr. Phil would tell us. I often wonder why people look everywhere but to Jesus for the answers to their questions and woes. Maybe the clergy are not doing such a good job. There's a story maybe you've heard. I don't know that this is really my story, but maybe. But there's a story of a woman who came to see her pastor about a personal issue. And in between her sobs, because she was sobbing uncontrollably, and in between her sobs, she told her pastor that she had just had a horrible argument with her husband. <clears throat> and she said, and the last thing he said to me was, you can go to the devil. And her pastor asked, well, what did you do? And the woman replied, I came straight to you. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I know that I'm not the devil, but I also know that I am not always the best role model. I'm human. Clergy are human. But let's think about this. Perhaps people shy away from seeing Christ as an everyday friend to rely on because Christians who are most noisy about claiming his wisdom and authority come at us from the angry God angle. Who would want more of that? 
If we really look into the metaphorical story that Mark's Gospel gives us today, we can see evidence of Mark's attention-getting techniques. No TV 2,000 years ago. No industrial light and magic to make the spaceships fly and the buildings blow up to get our attention. Language that would knock your socks off is the way to make a point. The confused disciples are told that someone who is not with them, yet not against them, is really for them. And getting a cup of water handed to you is proof. The cutting and plucking exhortations are demonstrable, extraordinary actions meant to vividly instill the requirement to have integrity in the way we live our lives. Because if we do not, what good are we to anyone, even ourselves? The conclusion can rightfully be made that the angry God angle is bent way out of shape. So let's throw it out. I'm not sure if you're aware of how you personally advance God's realm. Do you think about that? How you personally advance God's realm But you had a practice run this morning. As you filled a cup and then placed it over here on our worship center, you rehearsed the motions of God's love for all. You didn't maybe even know you were doing that. But you were, Blanche. <laughs> now all you need to do is remember that. As simple as it is. And remember that the story speaks not about what we do, but rather it is about what people do to us and for us, no matter who they are. A simple act of kindness is the kinetic energy of divine presence, whether you think about it or not, whether you do it or not, whether somebody else does it to you, also, a kind gesture from anyone is a display of God's will. Question anger, not kindness. When kindness happens, God is there. And the kindness of someone who is from another religion or no religion is all from God as well. One does not have to be a follower of Jesus to give Christ's love to someone. That is a real truth to ponder and accept. The point of this passage is that actions matter more than words. We can say all we want about faithfulness, but unless our actions bear truth to those words, they are as empty as a cup with no water. To use the metaphors we are given in our gospel, as painful as they sound, we are not complete without kindness and integrity. Where there is kindness, there will be worthiness and peace. And I think this is what our all-loving God is always trying to get through to us. And I think we follow, I think we follow Jesus because he is our great source for all of this. Amen.